Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is your host, Morteza Hajizadeh from Critical Theory Channel. And today I'm very excited to be talking to four great minds, four experts on Marx to talk about a wonderful book called The Last Years of Karl Marx, an intellectual biography written by Marcello Musto uh, and published by Stanford University Press in 2020. With me to discuss this book, I have got the, uh, the author, Marcello Musto, who is a professor of sociology and the founding director of the Laboratory of Alternative Theories at York University in Canada. I have David Norman Smith, a professor of sociology at the University of Kansas, whose work focuses on the intersection between political sociology, political psychology, and political economy. I also have Peter Hudis, a professor of philosophy and humanities at Oak Oakton Community College and the author of Marx's concept of alternative to capitalism, and also Sean Sayers, who is a professor emeritus of philosophy at the University of Kent, he has, and he has published extensively on, the, on topics in Marxist and Hegelian philosophy. Uh, welcome, everybody, to New Books Network. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the way we go ahead with this interview is that I've got five questions. I'll just ask, I'll pose the questions and you will each have four to five minutes or even more if you like to talk more about the topic and each question. Um, so I'll start with the first question, the last years of Karl Marx. But before that, I do like to get your thoughts on why questions about Marx and Marxism have been revived again in the past uh, few years, especially in the past five or seven years, there has been this renewed energy and renewed interest in Marxism. So why do you think Marx and Marxism is gaining more traction in the past few years? Uh, Marcello, maybe we should start with you. Yes, perhaps it's interesting. Um, I teach in Canada. I moved here in 2009, but I come from Italy. Um, there is a country with a strong Marxist tradition, um, perhaps the strongest one in Europe in the 60s, 70s, still in the 80s. Um, so when I started my PhD in 2002, it was very difficult to, to publish a book of Marx or to see uh, writings by Marx and Engels in um, bookstores. Um, there was certainly a change political landscape. And, um, you know, the first one that we have seen, um, my generation, was certainly uh, what happened after the fall of Berlin Wall. So for 15, 20 years, we can say that there was, you know, silence on Marx and around Marx. And then, you know, things changed very much after 2008, as we know, with the uh, big and most recent economic crisis. But I would like to say that there is a new change political uh, landscape that we are experiencing in the last few years that is basically telling us that capitalism is in crisis, in deep crisis. This society is in crisis everywhere. So with these difficulties, without exaggerating too much, but we can certainly see um, a trend of, uh, you know, Marx revival, as I called it in the book that I published with uh, with Peter Hooders and um, uh, many other authors, a rediscovery of some um, relevance of Karl Marx. And we can observe this around the world. As I said before, Europe, North America, now there are several publications on Marx, sometimes very interesting secondary literature that, they bring in, that is bringing new um, um some perspective of Marx. We will talk about this later, I'm sure. Latin America is also a country where perhaps this rediscovery of Marx had already started <clears throat> for and for political reasons. And then there is, of course, a big country like China. We should not underestimate the fact that they have opened the possibility for uh, many um, foreign authors to be translated into, into China, into Chinese. So let's see if a small part of this uh, generation that is there is going to read this text and use them in a, in a critical way. And then there is uh, also another example, the case of our dear friend Koei Saito, who revolutionized a little bit uh, Japan in the past few years with this uh, uh, book that had um, such a strong impact on Marx and the Anthropocene. So <laughs> there are options, there are um, possibilities to look at uh, the Marx Forschung, the research on Marx in the world today in a positive way. We must also, we could also talk about, I don't have the time, my time is over, but what kind of Marx we are reading today. 
and if it is um, the same marks that was read before or not. I'll just finish with this with 30 more seconds. I am against these ideas that um, every time there is a new manuscript of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, uh, you know, some scholars say, oh, this is an unknown Marx. Everything that we knew about Marx before was wrong. All the generation had read Marx in the last 150 years didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> so I am strongly against this. But I must say that uh, the profile of Marx has changed in the past um, 20, 25 years. Perhaps I will, you know, <clears throat> say something risky, perhaps is not the correct, but I will say that Marx is one of the classics whose profile has changed uh, more in the last 20, 25 years. And this was thanks to the Marx Engels Gesamtaus Gabe, to this many new volumes. Uh, that have been uh, published in uh, in Berlin with uh, so uh, many uh, new information about uh, the notebooks of Karl Marx. You know, I've written my books, uh, my book, The Last Year of Karl Marx, based uh, especially on his notebooks, some of them still unpublished. And uh, also looking at some editions of previous books that were not books, but just manuscripts of Marx, and now they are published in a, in a better way. So we can look at this profile certainly in a much less dogmatic way. And we have also learned that Marx is certainly not only capital and labor, but his interests were much uh, wider and broader than this. I'll stop here for now. Uh, David, uh, would you like uh, to add to this, please? Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, I can chime in. So um, I, I agree that the climate has changed very much uh, intellectually and also politically. Um, in the latter part of the 20th century, Marxism uh, tended to be identified with the party dictatorship in Russia. And that was very constricting um, and also not accurate. And it was also a period when a lot of people in the West were claiming that the contradictions Marx had identified um, had been eclipsed, that affluence had replaced the kinds of problems and crises that Marx identified. And it has become increasingly clear in the 21st century that that is far from true. I think something else that uh, merits attention is the degree to which Marx's capital per se has become relevant to the world in a sort of new and expanding way. Um, way back in 1848, when Marx and Engels published the Manifesto of the Communist League, they predicted that capitalism would sweep the globe. And capital, das Kapital, is the work that systematically explains how that uh, was happening at the time and how it, it would continue into the future. Um, something I, I, I sometimes find it useful to say is that if we step back and ask ourselves about contemporary capitalist society or capitalist society as a whole, Marx is the only theorist who has attempted to explain the system globally and comprehensively. So countless others have weighed in. I mean, Keynes and Polanyi and Schroffa and myriad others have discussed aspects of global capitalism, the macroeconomics of the system, um, and many, many other details. But Marx offers a systematic perspective and it would be easy to dismiss that perspective if it didn't seem to capture um, important aspects of, of the reality. Um, I, I began studying capital decades ago, and I was initially skeptical about the degree to which capital would capture um, the emerging trends of the recent past and the present. But the longer I study capital, and I think many people are sensing this and, and, and doing the same, the longer I study capital, the more immediately relevant it seems. So uh, in my opinion, not only is Marx the source of, of a kind of systematic insight, not, not complete, not perfect, but a kind of systematic insight into the global trends we're experiencing, um, his relevance um, becomes uh, more visible um, and more palpable all the time. Thank you, David. Peter? Uh, thank you. Um... Well, ironically, I think one of the reasons for the Marx revival um, is the fact that from the 1980s, especially, and for decades afterwards, there was a collapse of Marxism, um, established Marxism. I'm not just referring to the Soviet Union, of course, and satellites in Eastern Europe, 
but the ideology and the political attraction of what called itself Marxist Leninism and other variants of Marxism that seem to have some sort of traction went into what we could, uh, I think, fair to say, following on Marcello's opening comments, a, a, a total eclipse. And I think this actually enables, ironically enough, the kind of revival of Marx, because as long as Marx's name is associated with various tendencies of 20th century Marxism that had uh, from a, a, a Marxian perspective, a rather narrow understanding or interpretation of Marx, it was not likely to appear, appeal to a new generation who was re, uh, in, engaging in the realities of modern capitalism, contemporary globalized capitalism. So then when you get to a period like starting in the early 2000s, uh, the critiques of the anti-globalization movement from the left, this is, of course, from the WTO protests, we get the 2008 uh, global recession, uh, which uh, really shows uh, the uh, the serious shortcomings of, of capitalism to a lot of people. We're not talking about just in academia. We're talking about the glaring levels of inequality that were exposed by the Occupy movement or addressed by the Occupy movement. All of these things bubble up, as well as new uh, movements, of course, and issues surrounding questions of gender and race and <laughs> ecology, et cetera. People uh, begin to, uh, th there is a, a common, there's a new generation on the scene by now which virtually takes it for granted that they don't have a future uh, because uh, as so long as capitalism is here and that there is this sense that however one understands it, capitalism is not delivering what it used to be able to promise or at least what it claimed to promise. Uh, whether it be the kind of pr uh, free market capitalism or neoliberalism of parts of the West or whether it be the status so-called socialism or communism uh, that uh, adopted to the capitalist market models in one form or another, outside the West. So I think that uh, these factors coming together uh, does stimulate um, a lot of, there's a, a huge amount of interest in, in Marxism today in certain sections, in certain quarters. I don't want to exaggerate the importance of it, at least insofar as, as David was suggesting, there is this acknowledgement and recognition that, well, we have to understand what is, why is capitalism heading for, heading us and the system itself for self-destruction. And there's no better figure to turn to for that than Marx himself. And I think that that is part of what's going on here. There's one other point, though, which is going to seem a bit counterintuitive. And I think one thing that, in a way, it helps us, but of course, I'm not in favor of it, um, is the right wing. Um, I've been in the left for many, many years. I've lived in the United States my entire life. I have never remember, except maybe in when I first came into the movement in the early 1970s, and that didn't last very long, I never remember a major politicians, certainly not the president of the United States, getting up and saying the biggest threat to American society today is Marxism and communism. <laughs> and this is what you're hearing from the far right, right? Uh, they can even call Biden a socialist, which is absurd. But the point is, is that why are they using this language? There is a fear among those holding on to the old order that there is an attraction among many young people uh, for revolutionary ideas. Uh, and, and I think that that's a sign that something really important is happening, both openly and under the surface, that is reflected in a interest in Marx's work and also issues not just of his critique of political economy, but the areas that surround that on gender and race as well. I think that the issue of race, especially in the United States, has drawn a lot of people to try to think about this question of racial capitalism and then ask a big open question, does Marx or Marxism adequately address that? Thank you, Sean. Well, it's different. I, I think previous speakers have pretty well covered the bases here, but and I agree with almost everything that's been said. Um, you know, there was, I mean, we've all experienced it. There was a, a, a very serious collapse of uh, interest in Marxism, uh, uh, commitment to Marxism, and socialism more generally uh, after. Uh, 1989, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and Eastern European communism, even though few of us probably supported those forms of Marxism and communism, it had a it had a chilling and disastrous effect on Marxists and on the left. And uh, you know, even and in this country, in in Britain, where I'm talking from, which does not have a strong uh, communist or Marxist tradition, or at least not in not in in my lifetime, and uh, you know it, it was it, it virtually died. I would say uh, interest in Marxism, uh, 
Uh, and, you know, when Fukuyama said it was the end of history and, you know, it was a sort of capitalist triumphalism, which which prevailed for the next uh, decade after that. And I agree with the other speakers that it was really the financial crisis of 2007 and eight, which got, which, which people realized that Marxism really still had uh, a great deal to say to them, uh, to explain what's going on in the, in the modern world. And suddenly uh, interest in Marxism revived and it didn't stop in 2008 it's continued and in many ways grown since then and i'd I, you know i think peter has made some you know i think it's very important to realize that the collapse of the soviet of soviet communism and the soviet model also allowed a much more open dialogue on the left with feminism with uh movements for racial equality with environmental movement so that the so that Marxism has, you know, come into dialogue with these other strands of the left. And I think that's uh, strengthened Marxism and, and strengthened an interest in Marxism because Marx, Marxism has a great deal to say to those different uh, groups. It's wrong. You know, I think the view often earlier was that, Mar you know, Marxism doesn't, you know, these are not the core struggle of the working class. Marxism really doesn't have anything to say to them. That's quite mistaken. And I think people are realizing that now. There's a much more open, a much more diverse uh, development on the left with Marxism in, you know, in the central place in that dialogue. And I think that's continued very much after uh, 2008. And if anything, grown stronger in the, in, in the years up to now. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let's talk about some of the uh, topics in this book, the last years of Karl Marx. And I, I really liked what Marcello said in his uh, opening remarks about the Karl Marx that we're reading today might be different from the Karl Marx that was read back in in, um, in the 19th century. So perhaps you could all uh, ad address this, this topic as well when you're answering the next question. So my next question is that, Marcello, you've written this book and you've mainly focused on the last two years of his life. So if... Uh, do you think a review of his thoughts in the past years of his life would give us a different understanding of Marxism? How is the old Marx different from the young Marx, broadly speaking? I know it's a very general question. Yes, thanks. Very quickly on the first part of your question, I will say that every generation has read a different Marx because Marx has the particularity of having left many unpublished manuscripts. He wanted to do so many things. He wanted to... Uh, write and say something on so many projects, um, topics. It was very self-critical and he decided that uh, it was not good enough and uh, that uh, manuscript remained there for Engel, Kowski or uh, a future generation of mega arbiters. But I will say that we can no longer discover an unknown Marx, to use the expression of Martin Nikolaus, who translated the Grundrisse, because we have already seen in the past generation significant manuscript, like for example, the Grundrisse, or like for example, the second and third volume of Capital, which is what Engels did, or all the young Marx that was published in 1932 in Moscow, but actually started to circulate at the end of the world from the end of the forties. I will say that the last manuscript that has changed the perception of Marx where the, uh, anthropological notebooks published by Lawrence Crater at the end of the 70s, but such a complicated text that, you know, the revolution of this text is uh, uh, slower compared to the others. So, yes, we are reading a different Marx because, of course, when we read the last year of his life, we can almost, let me be very irreverent today, laugh at uh, the um, formulation of the 1859 preface to the critique of uh, political economy. This idea of progress, this philosophy of history, this modes of production that should um, uh, manifest themselves around the world in the same uh, form, like you know, from uh, slavery to feudalism to capitalism and socialism. The, the story here is much more uh, complicated. And I think there was um, a big responsibilities of biographers of Marx 
because many of them said that Karl Marx died in 1872 at the end of the international. I understand the old biographers of Marx because they didn't have these new materials, but there were many significant important biographies, including the one that were published just a few years ago for the bicentenary of Marx that have ignored, you know, a, a big chunk of documents of Marx and already a significant scholarship that has demonstrated what I'm trying to say in this book, which is that not only Marx continued his research in the last decade of his life, I'm just focusing in particular on the last three, but of course I'm starting from the 70s, but that actually Marx expanded his research. They exp he expanded his research thematically with, uh, I already mentioned anthropology, I could mention many other things, but I don't want to say everything. There are other comrades uh, talking after me. Um, thematically, of course, geographically, uh, Marx is now focused on Algeria, Egypt, uh, India, one more time, Russia, of course, as we know, uh, Indonesia. And, uh, and then, of course, there are many topics that are very relevant for Marx. Um, um, David has written a, a masterpiece for me in uh, the um, a book that I edited, uh, Rethinking Alternative with Marx. And look how good he was in order to explain us how migration was important for Karl Marx. And how he had observed you know, the fact that this forced movement of workers generated by capitalism is so central for exploitation and also to divide the working class. What should I tell you? Ecology, you know that it's very clear that socialism for Marx at least can no longer be um, indicated like you know the mere development of productive forces and Marx is actually saying that there is a theft of the uh, labor of the workers but also the pillage of natural resources this is so clear in many documents of the last 10 15 years of his life and then there is more the critique of nationalism the potential of technology many other topics including one that is very important for all the four speakers that are talking today that is freedom the idea that communist society is a society with freedom with the full development of emancipation and democracy so i want to end this by saying that all these topics that are very strong in the so-called last marks are fundamental issues of our time are fundamental issues of our political agenda and I believe that this will help Marx to be at the center of the political debate not only for his critique of political economy and capital which is the most important thing that Marx has done you know without any question but also for these other themes that I mentioned and um, I'm sure that there is a future for Marx but it is also our task to make this complicated document, manuscript, unpublished material readable for a new generation of activists and students. And, uh, you know, we might want to talk about this later. That's all for me now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David? So, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to build on Marcello's comments. So when we're talking about the last two years of Marx's life, we're talking about 1881 and 1882. Uh, and prior to that, uh, Marx had worked for a long time and published the first volume of Capital in 1867. He actually continued to revise Capital all the way through 1874. And when I say Capital, I mean Volume 1, because Marx did not live to publish what we now call Volumes 2 and 3. So what was Marx doing in the final years of his life? I mean, he improved Capital in the two German editions and improved it still further in the French edition of 1874. He turned from volume one to the volume two that he was planning to write, which I think would have been a different book than the one we're familiar with. Uh, he built, especially in the manuscripts that he was writing on capital themes in 1877 and after, he was building especially on a, a point he had made about the accumulation of capital uh, in the first volume. And that point uh, is famously that the accumulation of capital is the accumulation of the proletariat. In other words, the accumulation of wage workers. Uh, 
Marx's premise was that capitalism would sweep the globe uh, to to varying degrees, not entirely, but that its tendency was to sweep <clears throat> the globe. And what that means in the simplest possible terms is that capital in a, an increasingly large number of places would hire workers. The wage relationship is the essence of capitalism. If you pay careful attention to all of the examples that Marx gives in volume one of Capital, he's talking about the principles of capital, uh, the principles of capitalism, primarily with reference to Great Britain. Uh, there are very few references to the development of capitalism in France, Germany, North America, or elsewhere. But Marx's premise was global. And in what in the materials that he was writing um, after 1874, he was focusing on the rest of the world. I'm going to make a, a point that I think uh, bears on what Peter said at the end of his earlier comments. Uh, one of the really positive developments in uh, intellectual life in general in the last decade or more has been the theme of intersectionality, which is obviously a multi-syllable word for the interpenetration of the interaction between race, class, gender, ethnicity, nationality, and more. I think that's fundamental. And I think the, the lens that the theme of uh, the overlap of race, class, and gender provides gives us a better way to appreciate what Marx offers. So I will just say briefly that uh, I have been working with the manuscripts that Marcello alluded to, the uh, ethnological manuscripts that Lawrence Crater published in, in a, a complicated edition um, 50 years ago. Uh, that edition was complicated because Marx wrote simultaneously in German and English, sometimes with French, sometimes with uh, Greek, uh, little passages in Hindi. Uh, so it, it's a book that's more famous by reputation than in terms of what people have learned from it. But thanks to the uh, uh, the collected works uh, that's underway uh, in in, Ber in Berlin, uh, Mar the Gesamtausgabe that uh, Marcello has referred to, uh, we now have access to quite a few other manuscripts from the final three, four years of Marx's life. So to conclude briefly, what was Marx doing in that period? Um, my reading of the original manuscripts of what's called Volume 2, which are now available, the ones that were not edited by Engels, um, my reading of those manuscripts and others makes it clear to me that Marx was writing capital when he looked at Algeria and India and Indonesia and California and Australia. Marx was talking about the accumulation of the proletariat on a global scale. And that proletariat is inherently multi-ethnic, inherently one with gender dynamics that differ from country to country to country. One of the main themes that Marx paid a great deal of attention to was the theme of bride purchase, which might seem far afield. But in reality, if you think about it for a moment, the purchase of a bride, which is a practice that prevailed in a great many places and still does prevail in many places, the purchase of a bride is a kind of purchase of labor power. What does a worker do in capitalist society? The worker sells the ability to work for a wage. To the extent that the practice of bride purchase prevails in a culture, um, you could easily infer that there might be a predisposition to understand and practice the purchase of labor power in different forms. Uh, I mentioned that only as one instance. Um, what, I, what I'm gleaning from the uh, really voluminous manuscripts Marx wrote on themes like this in the last years of his life is that he was in full progress towards a much bigger volume two than we, than we have. And that volume two was going to incorporate um, the intersection of race, class, and gender on a global scale. I think that's implicit in much of what Marx published in his lifetime, but it becomes clearer when we, uh, when we delve into those manuscripts. Thank you, David. Uh, Peter? Uh, yes, it's uh, the last several years of Marx's life, but taken in context with the entire last decade, from let's say 1780 to 1872 onward, uh, it doesn't change completely, of course, one's view of Marx. It doesn't m mean earlier interpretations were all necessarily mistaken, but there were some standard narratives that get called into question. Uh, certain, and some of them have already been mentioned. One of them is the notion that Marxism is a theory of class struggle. Uh, 
Secondly, that um, that Marxism uh, is a, a radical form of political economy. Marx was developing a political economy, but in radicalized form, radicalized expression. Third, a notion of um, that Marx developed a universal theory of history, sometimes dubbed historical materialism, depending on that's understood, in which Marx was not simply trying to understand the capitalist mode of production, but provided an overview of the entire expanse of human history. Well, when we look at the last years of Marx's life, especially, really, you can even take it back further from 1868, when he finishes volume one of Capital, the last 15 years of his life, all three of these get called into question, right? If Marxism is a theory of class struggle alone, then it's class reductionism. Uh, but is Marx a class reductionist? Um, that's a debate that's obviously going on today from many, many different directions in, in the left. And I think there's a lot of suggestions uh, in these later writings uh, that Marx was not a class reductionist, uh, not only in terms of his uh, a very different kind of appreciation of the role of the peasantry in developing or so-called non, or some cases, non-Western societies, as he's examining them in his last years, as compared with his largely dismissive attitude towards the peasantry uh, as it was constituted in West Europe in its earlier writings, but also uh, touching on, if not systematically developing, issues of race, uh, touching on issues of, of gender. Heather Brown has important work that deals with Marx's writings on gender and the family, et cetera. So, these are notes, right? Marx doesn't create a finished work out of this that one can simply point to and say, ah, uh, we have to work out its implications for a rejuvenated Marxism in the 21st century that would take Marxism beyond the confines of class reductionism. That's not his job, that's our job. But these notes and these writings create a basis for us to do so. And then of course, this question, which is a more contentious one, which I hope we can get into more here, was Marx a radical political economist? He entitles all of his books Critique of Political Economy, yes. Was he critiquing the foundations of political economy? That is, what was his, was his work in his last years to fill in certain aspects of his work on a critique of the capitalist mode of production that perhaps weren't adequately dealt with earlier or he hadn't paid attention to in order to create a kind of more broader, more systematic economic theory? But that then begs the question, why would, even if that's the case, why was he trying to do that? What was the purpose of his critique of political economy? And from my understanding, um, and I wrote my first piece on Marx's last decade, it was actually, I think, 40 years ago this week, <laughs> uh, I did a piece on the late Marx with South Asia Bulletin. Uh, and um, it, it, it's the more I read this stuff, the more I've gone through, Marcello's book has been extremely helpful in terms of this as well, is... I, I see Marx is the purpose of him wanting to finish capital and bring in all this material that David was talking about is Marx's is critique of capital is a critique of dehumanized human relations. And if we, if we think of that as what a viable Marxism at least should be, Marx was just pointing or giving indications in his work. And of course, it's, it's all subject to interpretation, how much stress we put on these things. But for the 21st century, I think that's what we need. Uh, we need a critique of all the various forms in which commodification, alienation, um, a, a capital accumulation, et cetera, invades and occupies our life world on an everyday level. And if Marxism can't address <clears throat> that, then it has no future. And hopefully uh, the future of Marxism will be, um, I'm sure it will be um, fructified uh, by the kind of material that uh, is in Marcello's book and in the researches that other people have done on this question and in further research and discussions that are going to be done on these writings in, in his late period, where it's very clear, uh, at least to me, that he is not trying to develop, he was never trying to develop a universal theory of, of, uh, of, of human history. He, he touches on it and where he does so, as has been suggested, sometimes doesn't do so so good, like in the 1859 preface. But when he says in 1877 to Mikhailovsky, I am not trying, I've never sought to create a universal theory of history. I think we should take that seriously. Uh, Post-Marx Marxists have been far less modest than Marx in their uh, claims about uh, veridical knowledge. Thanks, Peter. Sean, please. Okay, well, I first of all, I must say that I'm not an expert on Marx's uh, life uh, in any great detail. Uh, and um, uh, 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 I certainly don't know a great deal about, um, you know, the development of his 
of his thought. My impression was, though, and I think this is uh, confirmed by some of the things Marcello uh, is criticising, my impression always was that the last two years of Marx's life were, were, were pretty barren, that he was beset by illness, which he was, and had really stopped <clears throat> uh, writing and almost stopped thinking. And what I found most illuminating about uh, Marcello's book was he absolutely refutes that and shows what an extraordinary uh, active uh, intellectual life Marx was, uh, you know, was living right uh, to the very end of his life. I, I found that really, really a wonderful, inspiring uh, thing about the biography. <clears throat> now, let me just pick up a few other things that people have said. Marcello um, said, you know, that the publication of Marx's notebooks now is not going to reveal a new Marx or words to that effect. And I, you know, I think he's right about that. I mean, I think, you know, people have tried to claim that these are going to completely overturn uh, our previous views of Marx and reveal uh, sort of, you know, a completely different uh, aspects of his thought. I don't think it's going to, they're, they're going to do that. They, they're illuminating enormously uh, in some of the ways that Marcello has shown, but they're not going to do that. But one thing they have revealed, I think, over the years, uh, which I do think has been, uh, illum uh, you know, really quite uh, important, is Marx's enormous interest and the enormous amount of work he did on natural sciences, on chemistry and physics, particularly in relation to agriculture, but agricultural chemistry, soil, soil dynamics. I mean, in a, you know, an environment, I mean, sort of in, an, an engagement, an interest with environmental questions, which I think has been revealed by uh, these, the publication of these notebooks. And it's really something that, that at least for me, uh, came as, you know, as a, a really important new dimension uh, to uh, uh, Marx's thought. Now, Mar Marcello also said that every uh, generation has read a different Marx. And of course, that's true, I think. But isn't that mainly because every generation, not because Marx has changed, but because, uh, or new things have just discovered in Marx, but because we have changed, because every ge generation is different and asks different questions of a body of theory which is enormously rich and can illuminate all sorts of the, the different questions that are that are asked of it. <coughs> um, just one final point. Peter was saying that, you know, and I agree with what he was saying, that, you know, that that the that he, uh, some of the later works show, uh, particularly in, in his response to Mihalovsky, that, you know, there's no universal. He wasn't trying to produce a universal theory of history that would cover all ages and all 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 uh, types of society. That's true, but I think with the important rider, which I would want to add, that there are there are certain methods and certain fundamental uh, theoretical philosophical assumptions, which are usually summed up as the ideas of historical materialism, that. You know, in the last resort, it's the um, <clears throat> uh, the economic developments which which are determinant things, principles like that, and that we can analyze all societies in terms of the conflicts between the de uh, development of the forces of production and the relations to production. Certain general principles that are embodied in Marxist theory, which I think are universal, I think they do apply. You know, they, are, they provide a theoretical framework, a method which can be used to understand all societies uh, at all times. Of course, the results will be different because those societies are different and there's no one uniform course. Uh, I think that's what Peter was referring to, that uh, all societies are going to go through. But there are certain universals in Marxism, certain principles which can be used, this is my belief, uh, in relation to every sort of society and which are the guiding thread of uh, Marx's social theory. Uh, thanks, Sean.
let's move to the next question. But I must say that if if you want to add anything to what uh you know, you, what what you've said, so just feel free to to add. Right, don't wait for me to uh to to pose a question. Uh, my my next question is about uh, Russia. Why did Karl Marx consider Russia to be an obstacle to working class emancipation? And uh, did he change his views in the final years of his life? And it would be great if, in answering this question, you could talk about his views of the British working class as well. Hmm. Um, I would say that um, um, Marx had a very negative idea of Russia, um, an idea that was um, even considered like a Russophobia. Um, there is a, um, a well-known Marxologist that is dear to all of us here, that is Maximilian Rubel, and he wrote interesting things about this and also edited a wonderful collection of uh, different pieces written by Marx against Russia because mm -hmm. Russia is social backwardness, because it has a sluggish economic development, because of his uh, despotic uh, political regime, the conservative foreign policy. So you remember this idea that there is this big bear that is looking over Europe in the cartography of the 19th century. And that is an idea that also Marx shared. By the way, Marx wrote a book that um, was called The Secret Diplomatic History of the 18th Century that was published. This is a book published by Marx, but uh, many um, uh, problems with this book, in particular in the Soviet Union, where the book was published for the first time only in 1983, but in English for the Marx Engels collected works. Why? Because like many times in history, there are this little revenge, and if you change the name Russia and you put Soviet Union, some of those passages may remember the invasion of uh, Prague or of Budapest, you know, 1968, 1955. So the idea of Marx on Russia change over time, I would say yes. And this is a particularity that is happening in this very final period of his life, in the last years, in the final years of Marx's life. Because, and this is my, this might be an interesting connection with um, with United Kingdom, Marx was already uh, you know dissatisfied with Engels and many uh, revolutionary leaders about the attitude of uh, uh, British uh, uh, proletariat. The fact that basically also because they were enjoying uh, better um, living condition based also on colonial exploitation. So they had embraced the trade union uh, reformism and uh, there were every year less uh, chances that um, a revolution would happen there. Marx and Engels wrote that very clearly. Russia, on the contrary, was at the center of a, a very uh, remarkable um, political changes, first of all, I'm thinking about the end of serfdom, of course, in 1861, and then all this movement that we know very well, perhaps also because thanks to Karl Marx, right? Thanks to this letter received uh, um, from uh, Vera Zasulic, I'm talking about the Obshina. This story is very known, I don't want to talk about this. I would like to do something that I never do, but I would just like to read. <laughs> few small quotation from an author that Marx liked very, very much. There is so much about Marx and Hegel, Marx and Feuerbach, Marx and Proudhon, but uh, Chernyshevsky, who wrote in 1859, the critique of philosophical prejudice against communal ownership of the land, called the attention of Marx on something very significant. It is the fact that history will not develop um, um, at the same speed everywhere in the world. So just to read the small passages, Chernyshevsky, to which Marx want, to whom Marx wanted to dedicate a book at the, at the time he wrote, he wrote the British needed more than 1,500 years of civilized life to reach the free market system. The New Zealanders definitely did not take that long. Or this acceleration consists in the fact 
that in a backward nation, thanks to the influence of the advanced nation, the development of a certain social phenomenon leaps directly from the lower to the higher level, avoiding intermediate stages along the way. There are so many quotations that uh, Marx um, read from Chernyshevsky, and this is one of the reasons why Marx expanded his knowledge and starting from a <clears throat> time, as David told us before, he put Russia together with the uh, United States, of course, at the center of this research that is also statistical research, concrete um, uh, issues. So there is a, a strong intellectual influence on Marx that is coming at the same time of this very um, uh, political uh, significant uh, struggle of uh, the populist movement that Marx is supporting, of course. Marx liked very much uh, the way they responded to the specific condition of class struggle in Russia. Final warning, this does not mean that Marx turned into a new Herzen at the end of his life, that Marx you know, embraced the theories that he criticized for his entire life. Capitalism is still indispensable. Capitalism must manifest itself, but not everywhere in the world. And the fact that the capitalism exists in England, in Europe, made possible for this other society that we call today of the global south to start a revolution and to take quickly, much faster than European countries, the uh, development and uh, socioeconomic transformation that capi capitalism already developed somewhere else. Thanks. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can, I can build on that. Yeah, that uh, that's a really good framing. Uh, I, I would argue that essentially Marx's attitude towards Russia bisects into two halves. In the first half, um, as Marcello was indicating, he was primarily concerned with the. Uh, the military and diplomatic power that czarist Russia exerted, and he regarded uh, the Russian uh, state, the Russian empire, as an opponent of uh, social advance and, and the liberalization of culture and the development of a, a, a true working class movement in the West. So that was one dimension of Marx's uh, interest in Russia. But I think the more important aspect emerges um, in the 1870s, in the period that we're talking about, uh, it was in 1870 that Marx taught himself Russian. And uh, a great deal of what he did until the in, in the in the remaining dozen years of his life was deep inquiry into Russian social relations. So Marcello mentioned the fact that he was mastering a great deal of uh, statistical literature about the development of agriculture. Um, if we step back from the details, though, I think what emerges is very significant. Uh, Marx has been caricatured in a great many ways. Peter is completely right to stress the need to disabuse people of the idea that Marx was a class reductionist. Um, what Marcello was referring to with respect to the letter uh, and the dialogue that Marx had with Vera Zasulich um, is really important. Uh, Zasulich was part of a little nucleus of Russian radicals in the late 1870s who were influenced by capital. And they deduced that the world had to go capitalist in order to go socialist. And she wanted to know, and since her friends were calling themselves Marxists, as many people have since called themselves, um, she wanted to know, well, um, she wrote to Marx and said, well, you're Marx. Um, is this really the Marxist way of looking at the world? And he said, oh, no, by no means. He said, I think that what's, what capitalism has provided is a revolutionization of the means of production, that the technologies of production, the skills needed to develop production on the scale that would meet human needs in the future um, is something that the capitalism has been contributing, but it doesn't have to contribute the same thing over and over again everywhere. The, the wheel doesn't have to be reinvented everywhere. So Marx said that if we look at, um, if we look at Russia in the aftermath of the emancipation of 1861, when serfdom was abolished, um, we see a, survive, a peasantry which has many surviving communal practices. And Marx said it's unlikely, if we look at the situation realistically, it's unlikely that the communal peasantry in Russia will have the capacity to embrace 
the kinds of industrial advances that capitalism has provided and forge a new path to a, a humane society uh, without passing through the purgatory of capitalism. He said it's unlikely, but it would be desirable. Uh, Marx was in very close dialogue throughout the 1870s with uh, Nikolai Danielson, uh, a somewhat forgotten figure who was actually um, probably Marx's closest interlocutor on, on matters theoretical and, and critical in that decade. And like Danielson, Marx was aghast at the brutality of the expropriation of peasantries everywhere. He looked for sites of actual or potential everywhere. Resistance to what? Well, in part to colonialism, in part to the emergent capitalism that threatened to, um, as one of uh, one of Zasulich's friends said, that threatened to melt down the peasantry uh, and turn it into a proletariat. Um, I'll just say one one further word and then pass the baton to Peter. But we, we've talked about class and the working class a number of times. One thing I think it's really important to stress, and I was raising this with respect to Marx's attitude towards the peasantry a moment ago, but it's really important to understand that Marx had a social perspective on class. Um, many, many people in Zasulich's circle in subsequent generations had an extremely stereotyped pre-Marxian notion of social class. They thought the working class was the factory proletariat. That could not be farther from Marx's intent. Marx says that people who have no alternative but to sell their labor power to a boss belong to the working class. It's as simple as that. It's a social relationship. It doesn't matter whether you wear overalls and work in a factory. The issue is your relationship, your class relationship to employers, to employment. And it's that class relationship which Marx felt was increasingly the wave of the present and future. Um, but that did not preclude um, the hope that in places where agriculture or uh, other realms were still communal in some important respect, that they might resist their reduction to, um, to just units of labor in the, in the traditional wage sense. So Marx's views on this were, in my opinion, humanistic and thoroughly social from top to bottom. And I think, that, I think, I think his work on Russia really does help us understand that. Um, thank you. Um, two points. One, why did Marx uh, change his evaluation from Russia from seeing it as the uh, as the bastion of European despotism uh, to this positive appreciation of uh, Russia in the 1870s onward in terms of movements that have arisen and of uh, social formations within Russia that could potentially offer an alternative path to a, a, a non-capitalist society? I think it's not complicated, the answer. The answer is revolutionary subject, those two words, is that there, there isn't, Marx doesn't see a revolutionary subject in Russia prior to the 1870s. One emerges, or you can argue it was there before, but he sees it as emerging uh, in the 1870s with the revolutionary movement emerges within Russia that is challenging the basis of Russian despotism. And uh, that's important because as a good Hegelian, Marx knew that uh, the key to resolving contradiction is the self-development of the subject, okay? So you keep your eyes on the subject that is, what are the oppressed doing? Where are their possibilities of resistance? What are new forms of revolutionary agitation? And Marx is very inspired by what he sees in the 1870s coming from this new generation of revolutionaries in Russia, variously termed populists, etc. And he learns Russian not because he's bored and wants to learn another language, but because he wants to make contact with this emerging revolutionary movement. And he wants to analyze Russian society in order to see what are the potentials for this revolutionary movement to overcome the contradictions of Russian despotism and Russian society. And that's why he is so infatuated and fascinated uh, when he sees, well, he had earlier studied the communal forms of so-called Germanic societies in Western Europe earlier back, communal forms that existed earlier. Even when he was growing up in Trier, he talks about the remnants of this. But now he sees, ah, but this is still persisting in Russia, in the Opshina, in the Mir, these communal forms of working and owning the land. And now that raises the whole question in the discussion with the populace, can this become 
a basis for uh, a possible alternative path to socialism or communism uh, for the Russian revolutionaries. So it's all about, in my view, the question of keeping your eye on the human subject and, and not simply holding to a conclusion that you reached uh, independent of that. Now, that raises a big question, at least in my mind, though. Uh, why is it that the Russian Marxists, who begin to emerge, the first group, of course, is 1882, Marx says in his letter to Sasulich, who says to him, well, my Russian Marxist friends tell me that you think Russia has to go through an extended period of capitalism uh, and the Mir and the Pshina will disappear and we have, should forget about that. What's your view of this? And he says, well, I don't know of any Russian Marxists that you're talking about. The ones that I'm in contact with, right, don't have that view. Now, who are these Russian Marxists that he's in contact with? It definitely is not Pakhanov or Axelrod, okay? I'm not denying that they're important figures. They actually deliberately buried Marx's letter to Sassoulich. Literally, Pakhanov put it in a drawer and did not tell party. It was, word was out that he had written this letter, the very short one, not the draft he didn't know of. But it was a deliberate suppression. <laughs> People certainly knew by 1882, uh, Marx and Engels wrote the new preface to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, where they spill out, spell out their uh, the question of whether or not uh, the Abshina or the Mir can be a fulcrum of revolutionary regeneration in Russia, which he leaves as an open question uh, in, the, in the preface. But the point is, is that scour the works of Russian Marxists uh, from the 1880s through the 1920s, up into at least up to 1917, and try to find the number of people, uh, where, even Lenin, Luxembourg, etc., the best of them, Marto, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How many references there were to the 1882 preface? Uh, that's uh, I, I've been doing some work on this, and it's remarkable how much it was not just overlooked, but the knowledge of it was suppressed because Marxism took root in Russia as a rejection of the entire populist thesis to the extent that even the fact that Danielson was the translator of capital, they had this extensive correspondence, Marx sent Danielson the unpublished letter to Mikhailovsky uh, that was referenced where he says, I don't have a universal theory, which Danielson publishes in 1908, 1893, I'm sorry, in 1893. So it was certainly known by the Russian Marxists. They could not have avoided knowing that the late Marx had these views. This is why I want to emphasize an earlier point to Marcello, it's not like, hey, there's some secret obscure manuscript tucked away in Amsterdam or Moscow that now we're talking about that, oh, this changes everything. A lot of this stuff was known for 140 years, right? It was already published, some of this material, fragments of it at least. Why did it not impact post-Marx Marxism? And that's the real tragedy of the 20th century Marxism. When you actually, I don't want to go into it for the sake of time, just throw it out. It actually turns out from the research that I've done is it, it's pretty clear that in 1905 revolution in Russia, by the 1905 revolution, in Ukraine, the Mir and the Yapshina are pretty much gone, but not in central Russia. And as a result of the 1905 revolution, actually the Yapshina and the Mir become strengthened as peasants seize the states and the peasantry becomes a more active role in the revolutionary process. In a certain sense, it, it, it gains a kind of revival in certain parts of central Russia. This is not what was, this was misunder, it wasn't on the radar screen because people had this, were brought up to believe, no, that's not Marxism. Marxism is a theory of class struggle. Marxism is about the industrial proletariat. Everything else is secondary. And he has this unilinear view of history. And that's what Marxism is. If you don't have that, you're not a Marxist. Well, Marx in this view is not a Marxist either. I'll throw in a footnote, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, Vera Zasilich's biographer was very perplexed trying to analyze what Marx had written to her. And he concluded, Pekanov was the real Marxist, not Marx. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, again, I don't have great expertise on the, these sorts of issues. But in answer to the question, why did Marx consider Russia, or well, the Russian state, I guess that means, to be an obstacle to working class emancipation, uh, the answer surely is that it was. Uh, it was the main center of reaction uh, in Europe through, throughout this period. Um, <clears throat> and um, what happened, though, as people have said, is that after the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, a rev revolutionary forces began to develop uh, in uh, Russia. And... <clears throat> uh, that uh, led to uh, very important 
social movements, very important debates in Russia about the nature of Russian society and how it could be transformed. And Marx, as has mentioned, learned Russian in this period in order to uh, learn from those debates and in order to uh, contribute to them. But the Russian state seems to me remained a, a reactionary force uh, right through. It was rather that the new social forces, new political forces were emerging in Russia. Uh, and those are what uh, uh, interested Marx. Uh, thanks. And and now we have talked about Russia. I think, uh, uh, Marcelo, you wanted to add something? Yes. You told us that we can um, uh, say, uh, so, break a little bit the scheme. And um, yeah. I wanted to use the chance to ask a question to my comrades and, and colleagues. Peter told us uh, that Vera Zasulic didn't publish this short letter that arrived in her hand. And also David um, um, informed us about the uh, point of view of the main biographer of Vera Zasulic. I would like to ask, uh, to ask a short but complicated questions to my, to my colleagues. And the question is, why do you think that Marx did not publish the longer version of that letter, which means Marx wrote significantly in those three weeks between the arrival on the letter and then you know on the uh, letter that he sent, the short page that he sent to Vera Zasulic. And this was one of the most productive moments of the last years of Karl Marx. It's also fascinating that Marx is studying some of these issues, I'm talking about pre-capitalist society, from the point of view of anthropology, and then he's also responding to this question from the point of view of, you know, political um, um, dimension, right? So my question is, do you think that Marx didn't have enough courage to publish this uh, complicated text and... Uh, you should have focused a little bit more of energy, perhaps, you know, to make it a little bit uh, shorter, but to say something about this question instead of just sending this uh, short letter to Vera Zasulic. What is your opinion on this? Well, I, I can throw in a comment on that. Uh, we've been talking about the last two years of Marx's life, um, which I don't think Marx realized were the last two years of his life. Uh, you know, Marx had not had not even reached what in the United States would be regarded as retirement age when he died. I mean, he was uh, he was six years younger than I am now when Marx died. So the the Santa Claus image that people have from the photo that was taken of him late in life with his billowing hair, looking like you know like the uh, like Father Time. He was actually not that old, and as as recently uh, you know up up until the eve of his death, he thought he was still going to publish um, this much bigger, better volume two of Capital. So with respect to the Zasulich letter, uh, clearly Marx wrote four drafts, and he did ultimately send her the shortest draft, which then was suppressed in the way that Peter described. Um, I don't think, I think that Marx might simply not have wanted to take a lot of time to engage with this uh, small nucleus in Russia at that moment. He was actually engaged in a lot of debate with people in, in the French Socialist Party at that point. And uh, he, I, I don't think he, and he was, uh, you know, corresponding with, uh, as you as you point out well, Marcello, with uh, Demela Nievenhuis in, in the Netherlands. Um, the odds are good, in my opinion, that he would have returned uh, to that theme if, if he had lived longer, as, as he would have returned to many things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if I can jump in here. Uh, I think that Marx uh, obviously w went through a lot of wrestling trying to answer this simple letter from this young woman. I and mean, really, she was very young at the time, right? Uh, and the amount of intellectual energy he put into drafting his response is quite enormous. I think that Marx was, I think Marx, my supposition is, is that Marx realized that he has to know a bit more before he can add a, come to a conclusion to this question. So he basically says, look, 
in the letter that he sends her, says, this is not what I'm doing. I'm not saying that what I delineate in the historical tendency of capital accumulation at the end of capital, sections on primitive accumulation, et cetera, that is the fate that Russia is, has to endure. I'm not saying that. There is a chance that it can go a different way. That's it, okay? But to, to, to go deeper into that, would really mean, what, when you look at the drafts, what are they? They're very fragmentary, right? And there's not a singular position. He has different positions that he shifts in and out of as he's, he's thinking out loud, okay? Um, Marx needs to do more work before he can really adequately answer that question, I think. Um, and uh, it's a shame that he didn't live long enough to be able to write uh, a fuller statement. So fuller statement we have is the 1882 preface to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, where he repeats the basic theme that is central to the Zasulish correspondence, um, but doesn't go further than that, right? That too is tentative. And I think it's proper that it's tentative because if the task of a dialectician is to grasp the object of investigation in its entirety, to grasp it as it is in and of itself, as it's again, simply a, 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 a applying a formal schema on top of the subject matter, to derive some prearranged conclusion, preordained conclusions, if that's not what dial, if, if dialectics is against that kind of an approach, it's an enormous challenge to avoid applying dialectic and instead to recreate it from the subject matter in front of you. So I think Marx needed more years. Well, yes, <laughs> uh, I mean I I think I agree with that. Um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, what, uh, but um, you know, I, I mean, I think he was grappling with extremely difficult, uh, a huge issue about the future of uh, Russia and how how uh, the, the uh, society was going to develop there. And it's a, it's an enormous question to to try and answer. And what what is clear from Marx's late writings is that he was very willing to think this question out in relation to this specific conditions and particularities of Russian society without simply uh, applying uh, general formulae and 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 being uh, uh, content with that. And I think that's something that comes out very well in um, in Marcello's book and I think is a very uh, valuable theme in it. On the other hand, and another theme I think that Marcello uh, stresses in his book, is that some writers have tried to argue recently that Marx completely rethought that, you know, his whole uh, theory, his whole sort of historical understanding on the basis of uh, what was going on in Russia. And I think that's equally uh, mistaken. He was thinking these things out in, you know, in a, in a very concrete situation. And these were very large issues. And he didn't, I think, want to make, uh, you know, statements that were, you know, that were beyond his, uh, uh, beyond his, his, uh, his, his uh, uh, confident uh, views. One other detail, too, and that is that in the Zasulich uh, drafts, Marx at one point draws upon the uh, ethnological manuscripts that he's been uh, he's been working on. So I think this bears on Peter's point. Uh, I mean, Engels and Marx had a bit of a difference. Uh, Engels wanted Marx to just finish. He wanted him to be efficient to get those books mm -hmm. out. And Marx was uh, a perfectionist, I think, in a way that uh, that I, I think is admirable. He wanted to really know what he was talking about. He really wanted to be right. And so um, Engels produced volume two of Capital um, just two years after Marx died. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, this would have been a little bit hair-raising for Marx. There was so much more he wanted to say he did not regard the text that he had written as as holy writ. Uh, one one small detail with respect to the point that Sean made earlier about Marx's uh, trend to think about uh, environmental issues. In the original draft of the manuscript that Engels turned into volume two of Capital, Marx actually cited another of the late manuscripts, one which has not been uh, published or discussed uh, up until this point. And this is actually a book by uh, an author named James Geike, uh, which discusses uh, the ages of the of the planet in in terms that um, that bear directly on the whole idea that uh, climate changes uh, over long periods of history, and so that Marx was actually taking notes about uh, ice ages and the sort of like geological 
uh, shifts in in in, uh, in planetary history. And Engels, for whatever reason, um, did not include that that reference in the manuscript he published. So I do feel that Marx was very much um, preparing works in progress. Yeah, Mar and Marx was a you rightly say, I mean, Marx was a perfectionist, and that's in in a way the you know the extraordinary power uh, and strength of his thought. But it's all it is also a weakness. I mean, he couldn't finish things. He was constantly, you know, waiting for the next uh, crisis to show what uh, it would reveal. And for my own part, I would say, thank goodness for Engels for finishing these manuscripts, putting them out in a form that is. Uh, graspable and uh, and and useful. I mean, if we had to wait for and rely on, uh, you know, the notebooks in all their sort of you know mess and and disorder in order to grasp Marx's thought, we'd be a lot lot uh, less uh, informed about it, in my view. It's all very well to see these notes after you've seen the the sort of simplifications and order. That Engels brought to them, but to, if we had, if we didn't have Engels, if we only had the notes, I think we'd be, you know, it'd be only for the most dedicated Marx scholars, and an awful lot would have been lost. I think Engels done an enormous service to Marxism. Myself, agreed. I, I, I would simply say that what Marx was doing as well um, significantly enriches what we have in the form of Volume Two of Capital. Oh yeah. Thanks, very interesting. And um, I love the things that you said, in particular, uh, Peter, I like very much this idea of this um, young uh, Vera Zosulic that is asking a complicated question. And as Sean said, you know, it's Marx is a human being, right? So he put a very significant amount of work. We know this because we also know the condition in which he did that. He's, mm -hmm not yet the very, very um, sick and troubled person that it is later when he goes to France, uh, uh, Algeria, Switzerland, but, you know, he had uh, some problems still back then, had that problem, not talking about family issues, of course, and um, he's not able, he's not able to find uh, a final solution on this question, not because he has to engage with that small group of um, militant and activists. But, you know, this could have been the, you know, the um, uh, occasion for him to provide his ideas, his views on this. And, uh, you know, I agree with Peter. Certainly I'm not that, but I don't feel confident enough to talk about such a complicated issue without you know, making sure that I have all the information, like Sean just told us, that Marx was very, very perfectionist. In any case, we will continue, and we will certainly continue to discuss about this important question in the future. Thank you all. Great thoughts shared. Um, we have talked a bit about Russia, but let's talk about uh, British colonization of India as well and Marx's take on that. A few years ago, I was really surprised to come across Marx's writing that in a way supported that colonization, but I did not know that he changed his view towards the end of his life. So it would be great if we could talk about that and also uh, what he thought about capitalism. Was it all negative or did he first believe that maybe capitalism could, could have a civilizing aspect as well? So uh, floor is open. Uh, Marcello, perhaps you'd like to start. Yeah, I always try to <clears throat> frame a little bit um... <laughs> conversation with few um, um, textual references. So my opinion is very uh, clear on this point. Marx is against the destructive role of colonialism. Those who write the opposite are wrong, are clamorously mistaken. <clears throat> Marx has done this very clearly in uh, many, many moments and documents and kind of writings of his life, in the manuscripts, in the book he published, in the articles for newspapers, in the letter that he wrote, and more. Um, of course, the scholar and the political activist who was writing in the 1870s and in the 1880s 
as more information, more material, more political experience of the young activist and journalist that he was in 1853, when he wrote the famous uh, article in the New York Daily Tribune about British domination. But I want to say that in this um, uh, last uh, documents and manuscripts, there is uh, there are interesting um, um, comments about many aspects of um, you know colonialism, Western civilization. One of these are, for example, the uh, strong opposition against the racist connotation of many anthropologists who Marx was reading. And you know, is always against this Aryan jargon, this nonsense, this <laughs> written by them. So this is very strong in <clears throat> the uh, manuscript on uh, ethnology anthropology. I also want to say that this is not only about India, but it's about many other <clears throat> societies and countries. Of course, you know uh, the. Uh, colonization of Spain in, in Latin America and Mexico in particular, but very useful for me, the work that Marx is taking from Kowalewski on the French occupation of Algeria, where Marx is clearly saying with Kowalewski that every time that French colonizers are destroying their form of communal property, they are not doing <clears throat> something good to the future of socialism, but they are destroying the culture, this alternative culture to capitalism, this alternative culture to <clears throat> the relation, human relation, social relation of capitalism. And this for Marx is terrible. But one thing that Marx is doing, criticizing Kowalewski that I find very interesting, and this is one of the most beautiful things that I've read in the entire <clears throat> work of the last three years of Marx's life, is the opposition that Marx has against Kowalewski of translating the same interpretative category, categories of Middle East, of the Middle Age, for example, or feudalism into different historical and geographical contexts. So Marx is saying to Kowalewski, be careful, this is wrong. You cannot homologate phenomena that are distinctive. So you see how careful is Marx from this point of view and how much he differs from this um, misrepresentation that was done uh, many, many times. And that is still so trendy in academia today, in particular in North America with this you know, a crazy idea of identity politics. They try to represent Marx like a white racist person like many other liberals before him. So um, he has clearly written and with more information and once again, political determination because Marx didn't learn only through books but also thanks to political activity his leadership in the First International, the experience of the Paris Commune, the populist movement that we discussed a few minutes ago. So Marx wrote that British had only been able to destroy indigenous agriculture, to increase, to double the number and also the intensity of famine. And basically, this is a robbery of natural resources, environmental uh, devastation, and new forms of slavery and human dependency. This is very clear in Marx, and this is one of the strongest points of the um, elaboration and the ideas that he developed in the last years of his life. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree completely that this is very, very clear in Marx. And for anyone who listens to this podcast who would like detailed, lucid uh, ex accounts of, of the specifics, I recommend Kevin Anderson's book, uh, Marx at the Margins. Uh, he covers um, many aspects of this. Uh, if we concern ourselves with Marx personally, and there's obviously a tendency to try to weigh Marx's moral qualities, um, it's I think it's clear that there are some lines in the manifesto, and particularly in the 1853 essays uh, that Marcello referred to, which are unfortunate from the standpoint of the later Marx. Um, as far as I can tell, nothing after 1853 um, from Marx's pen in any way provides uh, aid and comfort to colonialism. Marx was 
uh, in a way that people uh, have disavowed for generations. Marx was a very serious humanitarian moralist. Uh, when I read when I read his published works, when I read his unpublished works, I'm struck again and again by how angry Marx gets when he talks about the oppression of people, so the expropriation of peasants, the man stealing and salabes, the bounties placed on on scalps by um, New England pilgrims and and others. Um, so if you just turn to like the final chapter of Capital, you'll find a great deal of anti-colonial sentiment. Um, and that, that anti-colonial sentiment uh, recurs in many places in Marx's late notes. Uh, Marcello points to the important passages in Marx's notes on a book by Maxim Kovalevsky. Um, Marx makes a very similar point about the issue of feudalism in notes on John Bud Fear, where he says, again, Feudalism is not a gen is not a generic term. This is not a universal theory of peasant culture. It, it requires serfdom, and it was specific to uh, Europe, uh, particularly in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. In any event, um, the point that I think stands out for me, though, is if we step away from trying to judge Marx, the question is what what did colonialism mean to him? And I see Marx focusing in the last decade on the collision between the expanding capitalist system and the rest of the world. And colonialism was integral into that. And so colonialism was not just a, a topic or a, a single theme. Marx studied intensively the experience of uh, French colonialism in Algeria, of Spanish colonialism in, in, in South America. He very carefully annotated a, an important book on the differences between British colonialism in India and Dutch colonialism uh, in Indonesia. Colonialism was one of the fundamental dimensions of the collision between bourgeois Europe, capitalist Europe, and the rest of the world. And it was a fundamental source of many of the, of the elements of world capitalism. Where did gold and silver come from? If we're talking about a system that runs on money, and that money was gold and silver, it came from Argentina. Uh, Marx talked about the indigenous peoples who were entombed, who were buried in the mines. What were they? What were they doing in the mines? They were producing silver. Mexican silver was essential to the development of, of commercial relations between Britain and China. So, on many levels, colonialism was an integral part of Marx's theory of the expansion of capitalism to the rest of the world, which, over the course of his life, Marx always opposed but grew increasingly hostile to and increasingly uh, eager to find alternatives whenever a possibility emerged. So again, with respect to the Zasulich letter, Marx was not optimistic, but he thought there was a possibility that, um, that capitalism and the alienation and exploitation it imposes, the expropriation it supports um, could be bypassed. The question of Marxism and its relationship to colonialism is very, very complex uh, because um, it's not a it's not a, a straightforward answer, right? That there are many tendencies within the Marxist tradition which apologize for colonialism or even supported it. There were many tendencies from the very beginning that that very, very strongly pushed back against it, including in the Second International. I mean, the Second International had a debate over this question and. Uh, uh, rejected a motion that would support colonialism in this 1907 Congress. But we're talking about Marx, though, not about Marxism. So I'll focus just on that point. Where does Marx fit into this? Um, you know, it's a shame that an article in terms of India that he writes in 1853, which was for a, jur a journalistic article, it wasn't a theoretical piece, that I imagine he probably wrote in like a couple of hours or a day, maybe, uh, becomes elevated by Said and so many others as this this is the expression of Marx on India and on uh, 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 the, the developing world, et cetera, non-Western world. Um, you don't have to wait until uh, the last years of Marx uh, to know of his uh, oppos fierce opposition to colonialism. Um, but again, it comes back to the question of the subject. What alters his view of India? What I think is the pivotal moment is the Indian uh, national insurrection in 1858, right? Uh, when he... Um, writes very approvingly of the insurrection. Again, there, he doesn't see a subject in India in 1853. So it's got to capitulate to capitalist development. And only then when the working class develops there through industrialization, you'll get that revolutionary subject. 
Now he sees, but wait a second, there is a national resistance movement. There isn't a working class movement yet. There is a national resistance movement, and he is very supportive of it. And that, I think, has a lot to do with his composition of uh, the pre-capitalist economic formation section within the Grundrisse, which is just around the same time, right? Now, this it's not that he's, now it's, I don't want to, I want to emphasize this. It's not that all of a sudden it's like Venus coming out of the clamshell, right? Uh, that there's a purity here in Marx that he just completely drops uh, the suppositions of what he had earlier stated in that short article in 1853. He's a white man living in Europe in the early 19th and mid 19th century, right? You can't help but be to imbibe uh, the unspoken biases of that culture that you grew up in, right? That's also true of all of us today, of course, too. Uh, what's interesting to me is despite that, which you see in various aspects of Marx, where that cultural imprint shows up in his writings, uh, is, is the ability to get beyond it, though, and to challenge it. And that's what you start to see in the late 1850s, and but you especially see it uh, in the Kobolesky notebooks, as several of you have mentioned, uh, and in other writings as well that we haven't discussed from uh, the last years of his life, where it becomes very, very explicit. Um, so one point here on the Kobolesky notebooks about this question of uh, of denying the application, he says we should not basic says we should not be applying European categories to explain non-European societies. So the notion of a uh, of Asiatic feudalism is one that he rejects. Okay, um, how many Marxists? I mean, there are a number of Marxists who also read Kovalevsky. Uh, I've written several pieces on uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, engagement with Kovalevsky. She read the same material. I don't know if she knew that Marx. If she knew about Marx, the extent of Marx's connection to Kovalevsky, but she drew a different conclusion, right? She 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 didn't object to his application of the category of European feudalism uh, to India and to North Africa. Marx does so. It, it, it's a remarkable thing for somebody, given Marx's background and the cultural suppositions that surround them at the time, for him to see past this kind of Eurocentric. Uh, kind of application of European categories to the non-European world. But lastly, it's very important, I think, always to know, Marx does not idealize or eulogize pre-capitalist economic or social formations. A lot of his notebooks on Kovalevsky are about what? The Code of Manu. This is what very much interests him, the caste system in India. And what role the caste system and kinship ties play, the kinship relationships plays in solidifying relationships of domination in a society that is governed by communal forms of property. So it's not the communal, it's not the form of property that I think is the fundamental issue for Marx, but the content of what a kind of property relationship signifies, what grounds it to give to oppressed people to resist given social formations or to amplify resistance to given social formations. So I, I also think that we have to be careful uh, not to fall into a kind of, eul Marx was not eulogizing uh, uncritically, uh, pre-capitalist or non-capitalist formations, he was trying to see what, and I, here is where I do think that there, there is a connection between Marx was, what Marx was doing on Russia and his other notebooks on India and Indonesia, Australia, etc. They're not worked out. There's no conclusions that we can say for sure what he would have drawn from this because he didn't com complete that work. But it seems to me that the question that Sassoulich was posing, that kind of subject, that kind of question, do we have to go through this traditional path of development that the West did? That's got to be what's on his mind as he's looking also at India and Indonesia and other places as well. Uh, I think that there is more of a connection there that is offered to soon. I don't think that as the, 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 the Russian material should be boxed off from this other material as if it's the exception. Uh, we can't say for sure what he would have made of this. Uh, I'm not saying he was as clear about uh, the revolutionary potential of the communal forms in India as he was about Russia, not that he was so reached a conclusion even with Russia, but I do think they're all part of, a, of the same kind of project. Yes, I mean, I, I, it's ridiculous, isn't it, to talk of Marx as supporting colonialism. I mean, you, I mean, anything you read of it, uh, about you know, even I mean, and, and perhaps particularly uh, the articles he wrote about the British rule in India. Uh, you know, it was excoriating uh, critique of the brutality and violence of the British impact in India, which completely destroys, you know, the, the material basis 
uh, of Indian society, the small the, the sort, of, the sort of village uh, organization of Indian society that it describes and, and sets them in a sea of woes, as he says. I mean, to, to talk of that as supporting colonialism is, if, I don't know how one could read Marx in that way. And similarly, although, of course, he does talk about the civilizing influence of capitalism, he doesn't support capitalism. I mean, that that's equally ridiculous and, sim and a sort of simplistic reading of what he's trying to say. What he's trying to say surely is that British rule in India, the, the impact of colonialism in India, the impact of capitalism uh, in, in Europe, uh, in the in at the beginning of the modern period is contradictory. Uh, it both destroy. It has a destructive and a brutally destructive impact on traditional uh, social uh, uh, organization and social forms. And yet, at the same time, it also, as he puts it, lays the material foundation for a, a, a change in a. And and a, the development of a new form of society, and is I think that's just exactly you know he talks about the dual impact of the British in India, and that's exactly what he's talking about. It's contradictory. It's not either you know, it's not either supporting or condemning. It. I, I don't think it's right to see it in those terms. It's trying to understand and analyze uh, what the impact is. Now, one area that I do think though that he's, I mean. I, can be, can be, I mean, that's unfortunate in Marx's writings, particularly on <clears throat> on colonialism, is that I think he's very, he's an uncompromising modernizer. I mean, he wants in the, you know, eventually Indian society to be transformed through the impact of colonialism, through the impact of capitalism. And that makes him, I think, uh, at, at best, uh, insensitive to the value that there might be in traditional Indian uh, forms of, of life and forms of culture. I mean, I, he's, he, I think he's, at the end of the day, you know, he knows that they're going to have to be transformed and, and ultimately uh, swept away. And I don't think he shows any great regret for that. It's a, I mean, it's a very difficult issue, I think, to, to confront. But I mean that is the effect of capitalism uh, throughout the third world that it does undermine and ultimately um, um, uh, destroy uh, traditional forms of culture and forms of life, and that is an ine inevitable effect. And I think Marx is, is, I think he's willing to accept that, and and um, uh, in many ways, uh, not show any real. Real regret for it. any real sense of the value, you know, the values that are being lost in that process. So I'm going to I'm going to jump in to simply disagree with that. Um, I think it's very clear, uh, again, from the letter of Marx's text, published and unpublished, that he was an unconditional opponent of colonialism. Um, we haven't even mentioned Ireland, which was one of his principal mm -hmm. concerns. Uh, Marx's anti-colonialism with respect to the you know, uh, British occupation of Ireland was a, a lifelong theme. Uh, Marx in the final years of his life uh, wrote extensively uh, in his private notes about what we would now call the neo-colonial strangulation by financial forces of Egypt, uh, which destabilized Egypt to the point that in 1882, England occupied Egypt, which Marx was aghast about and entirely <laughs> The, the, I think the, the import of what we have been saying with respect to the Zasulich letter is really critical. There has been a long tradition in the interpretation of Marx to think that he equated modernization with capitalism. There's no question that Marx believed that production was revolutionized in Europe, particularly in England, by the rise of capitalism. But the question Zasulich was asking is that is, is whether or not there has to be uh, an emergent capitalism everywhere else in order for uh, progress to be realized. And the very specific point that Marx made in the Zaslich letters, and which I see elsewhere, is that once the means of production have been revolutionized, nothing prevents other societies, other social formations, other classes from appropriating those advances. 
the idea that every culture across the globe has to basically repeat the history that that England went through, um, I think is is very remote from what Marx uh, was saying, and that he actually did express in his dialogue with with Danielson and others, he he very definitely expressed regret being lost. Marx did not want to see the rest of the world whitewashed. He did not want to see it like ground under and transformed into a replica of England. I think I think that's actually quite clear. But I mean, it was happening in India and there was no, you know, there were no uh, communal forms that were going to stop India being but Marx dragged actually into devoted, the capitalist system. But he actually so, devoted many, many months of the kind of arduous labor that Peter referred to earlier looking into the very fine specifics of agrarian social relations in the different parts of India. Uh, Marx, the fact that the fact that capitalism was extending to the rest of the world was not Marx's doing. He didn't not. simply he no, didn't anywhere. And he was well, trying to understand it. But that is right. what... so he wanted to understand it, but he wanted he wanted to transcend it as well. So if it's happening in, in Bengal, if it's happening in other parts of India to some extent, Marx wants to understand the particularity. Does he approve the expropriation of, of, of the peasantry here and there and elsewhere? Does he approve the, the way in which uh, countless millions of people were cast into limbo? Some of the most passionate passages in Capital refer to the, uh, to the destruction of, of the weavers in India. Marx has a, a critical passage where he's discussing how the evolution of the power loom industry in Britain has thrown millions of people in India out of work to the point, he says, that the plains are bleached white with the bones of the weavers who mm. had been destroyed, but whose, whose industry had, domestic industry had been destroyed. He has this passionate uh, discussion of the famine that killed over a million people in Orissa in India as a consequence of the uh, Brit of British colonialism. Um, so did Marx think that that the world would benefit from revolutionized production? Absolutely. Was the no, initial- Of course he didn't approve of these things. Of course he didn't approve of these things. Nobody's suggesting, uh, he, well, some but people may be, but that's an absurdity, as I said at the beginning of my uh, answer. If I can jump it's in not here. a question of whether he approved or not. He's trying to understand what's going on. And as Peter said, Certainly in 1853, there were no visible uh, movements of opposition, revolutionary subjects, even, even on the horizon then, that could have prevented that. Even by, you know, later periods of Marxist life, you know, a genuine revolutionary movement which could have uh, prevented uh, the appalling impact of colonialism in India were, were vestigial. I mean, virtually non-existent. That's the reality. Marx is, I'm of course not approving it. He's just trying to understand it. But I don't think Marx ever accepted the thesis that has become very common in Marxism and many other people, not, not just Marxists, that uh, modernization, capitalistic modernization will inevitably wipe away uh, non-capitalist or pre-capitalist social formations. And he was right about not wanting to make that kind of generalization. I mean, if you think about mm -hmm. Bolivian history and the, uh, the role that the Ayul plays, the kinship, uh, communal kinship structures in the Andean highlands, which I spent some time you know, researching in Bolivia, it, it, it's, it has retained itself. It's not true that all these forms, the communal forms uh, 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 of property or owning, working the land, et cetera, have just vanished with the advent of capitalism. As many parts of the world where you see incipient forms of this persisting right into the 21st century, let alone existing in Marx's time, uh, in his Marx's lifetime. And uh, there's a very interesting point that he makes in uh, the Zazulich drafts, where he says he thinks Russia has more revolutionary capacity perhaps than India, uh, because uh, kinship relationships have been broken apart, right? And um, uh, therefore, there's a greater likelihood of peasants and, and urban workers associating and coalescing together, right? What's interesting with the Bolivian example is that with the Ayul, so you have, it's originally in a, in a communal, rural, peasant-based context, right? But it's extended family kinship-based property relationship. Then there's massive dislocation of these peasants to El Alto, above La Paz in Bolivia, et cetera, which is now a million and a half by Mara's Olivia up there, et cetera. 
But precisely because it's kinship based, here's where it's, it's different than what Mark, Mark says, it facilitates work of peasant cooperation, which has everything to do with the history of Bolivia over the last 70 years of revolutionary struggles, which has had an enormously powerful labor movement, which has at the same time a strong worker peasant alliance to it. So it just isn't the case that this, mod, this, this steam engine of modernization wipes away all vestiges of a non-capitalist formation. That's the tendency, of course. And in some places, it's absolute. In other places, it's very rough. In some places today, I mean, we can talk about other examples in Southern Mexico or parts of Africa, et cetera, in the Philippines, et cetera. Some of these communal forms are still there. Corrupted, of course. No, no, I think you're quite right about that. I agree with that. I think Marx, I wasn't, I wasn't Marx, trying to say that's not the case. The fact that Marx is sensitive to this back then uh, is uh, something that we should methodologically learn from. We have to be careful ourselves of jumping to conclusions. Well, I, you know, I agree with you, and I think that you know each different case is different and has to be looked at in its in its specificity. And the strength of some of those uh, pre-capitalist forms it can be very, very strong and enduring, even in Europe. I mean, there's a letter that Marx wrote uh, saying even in the Hunsruck is local area in Germany, some of these pre-capitalist uh, forms, you know, survive. So that's that's quite true. Um, I guess what I was trying to say, though, is that I feel that, you know, there's a, there's a, I don't know how to put this exactly, and maybe this is just a, a, a loose thought, but a, a, a sort of, I mean, there is a human value, an enormous human value to traditional ways and traditional culture, which I think in, at, at times Marx is really not sufficiently sensitive to. That That's my feeling. I'll make one one last comment on on this subject. Um, I I do see much more human sympathy in Marx than than you, you perhaps are alluding to, Sean. Um, I do think Marx was extremely hostile to the brutalities and the indignities that people suffered. Um, but on the other hand, Peter is completely right. Um, Marx did not romanticize any culture, any period in history. Um, he saw he, he saw every culture and every period in history as contradictory. So there may have been many wonderful aspects to the classlessness of so-called clan culture, but many of those clan cultures also had bride purges. Marx did not support bride purges. He supported you know, freedom and autonomy uh, for all. Um, I, think, I think analytically, what, I, what I've gleaned from uh, my encounter with the late Marx on one level is something that the French uh, articulation school of the 1970s brought to the surface briefly. There was a about a decade when Pierre-Philippe Ray and others were talking about the articulation of modes of production. And I think that they were uh, capturing uh, a theme that was emerging in Marx and, and, and in more developed form, actually, in Marx. Again, what does it mean for capitalism to encounter the rest of the world? I, I like to say that there was a collision between capitalism and the rest of the world. The rest of the, at one point early in his life, Marx said that um, that commerce simply batters down tradition, defeats it. Um, in even in the Grindrisa, he said that money has a solvent power and it will disintegrate uh, the the social structures it encounters subsequently. But in the years after the Grindrisa, and particularly in the last five six years of his life, Marx became aware that the other cultures of the world have an integrity of their own. Um, they have they have they have a dynamic of their own, and that what capitalism really becomes as it extends globally is a patchwork quilt of articulated modes of production. Um, even to this day, even in a let, let's look at say Russia or China to say nothing of the myriad other countries in the world, there are articulations between the profit motive, uh, capital accumulation dynamics, and all of the cultural specificities that these different cultures offer. Uh, I think that's why Marx devoted years of his life to try and understand the texture and the flavor and the, and the dynamics of these other cultures, because capitalism wasn't going to be British capitalism everywhere else in the world. It was going to be something complex and multicultural in a, in a very dimensional way. You're muted, Martin said, you're muted. 
Oops, sorry, I, f- I forgot to unmute my computer. Thank you very much. Great ideas discussed here. Um, as a last question, I'd like to know more about his intellectual yeah. pursuits in the last years of his life. What, what sort of intellectual pursuits was he following? Uh, Marcello? Well, I think that we have a limited time and I will just mm. speak <laughs> any things that I wanted to say. And um, it is not a case that I will talk about history that is connected with the very interesting things that my colleague just uh, discussed uh, before me. In 1881, Marx spent a lot of time doing this uh, 550 pages of notes from 100 years before Christ to um, 1648 to the Treaty of Westphalia. And these have been called by Marxologists the chronological extracts. By the way, they were accompanied by other historical studies, like, for example, the note on Indian history that Marx took more or less in the same um, period. So there is interest in Marx, and this is one of the last unfinished projects that he embarked in his life, who, I would say, test his conceptions and look back to history Marx has done a significant work, historical work, in the late 50s. And, you know, my colleagues mentioned uh, this important section on the Grundrisse, of the Grundrisse. And then there is a lot of historical work that Marx has done between the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. It's fascinating. You can see that Marx is not interested only in Europe, like many people would have argued, or only in political economy, only in economic events. There is a lot about military history, the state, technological development in the Middle East as well. So this is very uh, fascinating and uh, important for me. <clears throat> and it's also an example of a scholar for us, right? You know, never <clears throat> being satisfied and uh, continuing the, the research. Now, I want to say that all this is happening at the same time that there is an hegemonic uh, interpretation in the 19th century, including the anthropologists, the ethnologists that Marx is reading, that event will follow a sort of pre-given course. And this course is independent from um, human actions. So there is this rigid sequence of stages that, you know, capitalism should... uh, uh, manifest themselves in this uh, uniform uh, destination. There are so many Darwinist oracles in in Europe uh, back then and also after Marx. And I think that sometimes Marx in these notes, in these unpublished notes written only uh, for himself, is sometimes a little bit uncertain or hesitant. But this is actually good. This is actually very good because he escaped the trap of economic determinism that many followers, that many continuators fall in after Marx. And I would like to end by saying that for me, it was very inspiring, not only looking at the answers of Marx, following this idea of Marx, the statue, Marx, the genius that has answers and correct answers, of course, for everything. But it's very interesting, you know, as a scholar, epistemologically, but also politically, the way Marx asked the question and also, you know, the many doubts that he had. So questions more important than answers and uh, a scholar, uh, a militant that is always trying to move forward and doubt, as we know very well, was essential for Marx, as he also said in the confession that he wrote in 1865, doubt everything was his favorite motto. So we should certainly use that. Dubitandum omnium, yeah, the quote from Terence. Um, I think one thing that that needs to be addressed with respect to Marx's final years is the interpretation that people um, have derived from what Engels wrote in Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, which Engels published based on Marx's notes on a book by Lewis Henry Morgan, just one year after Marx's death. And I'm in complete agreement with Sean that Engels 
very appropriately devoted most of the remaining 12 years of his life to work on volumes two and three of Capital. But it's an interesting fact that before Mark, before Engels edited volume two, he wrote a small book um, extrapolating from his reading of Marx's notes on Morgan. And the reason I bring this up is that the interpretation which many people have derived is that Marx had shifted focus and that his interest actually was in the origin of the family, private property and the state. And Marx wrote, besides the Morgan notes, which are very important, Marx wrote probably about 10 times as much based on books by Ludwig Lange, Ludwig Friedlander, Karl Bucher, um, it go, the list goes on and on, Rudolf Zohm. Marx was inquiring deeply into um, the, the into, into non-Western and pre-capitalist cultures. And it seems clear to me that his interest was only secondarily, if even that, origins. The world in 1880 was a world, it was a mosaic of different forms of, of class society, in some cases, societies which were not entirely class societies. Marx spent hundreds of pages trying to understand the indigenous cultures of the Americas and Australia. Um, and there may have been a, an element of an interest in you know, origins, but I see Marx trying to understand the world that uh, that capital again and the work and, and and workers uh, were facing in 1880. And from that entire mass of material, many many important themes emerge. Engels, I think, was completely right to point to Marx's critique of patriarchy as an important dimension of that work. And this and Peter referred earlier to Heather Brown's work, which draws that out. But something else that really stands out for me, it goes back again to the whole issue of what it means for capitalism to expand and to accumulate workers. Capitalism can only accumulate workers if labor power is available for purchase. And in contexts where means of production and labor power are bound tightly together, which is the norm whenever you have a, an intact farming culture, farmers don't want to lose their land and sell their labor power. Um, there's a spectrum of ways in which labor power um, is found and has, has flourished uh, around the world. And a theme that comes up again and again and again when Marx is talking about what Henry Maine had to say about ancient Ireland, when he's talking about what Rudolf Zohm had to say about so-called Verguild, which is the penalty that people pay when they injure somebody. Of their, uh, what Marx was interested in was the fact that people of higher status who were injured were owed more than people of lower status who were injured. So when their labor power was infringed, um, penalties were assessed and labor power was assessed at, in, a, in a hierarchy. There was highly valued labor power and there was lesser valued labor power. This connected directly to what Marx was observing in California when Chinese immigrants brought an entire different constellation of labor power and expectations with respect to, to compensation. Um, and then they were greeted by a kind of white nativist movement, particularly in the San Francisco region, um, that Marx paid a great deal of attention to and was, was hostile to. The white nativist reaction actually called itself the Working Men's Party. But Marx saw through that language. Uh, and what he wanted was what he said with respect to uh, white and black labor in the United States. He wanted ultimately harmony between workers, whatever their national or ethnic uh, background. So when he saw uh, a native, an angry nativist, violent anti-Chinese movement in California, um, he wanted to understand it, absolutely. But he also wanted to oppose it. And his own uh, friends and, and supporters in, in, in the United States at that point, Friedrich Zorga and the others, were very actively trying to oppose that. Yeah, if I can, to follow up on David's uh, very fine comments, um, I, don't, I also don't think what Marx was interested in the last years of his life was particularly the question of origins as much as futures. Um, if you want to write, if you want to get to, if you want to focus on origins, what's the purpose of that? It seems the origin of the family or the private property or the state or whatever. Well, that becomes important if what you think you need to do as a Marxist is, or whoever, is to contribute to developing some sort of a universal e e explanation of historical development, right? Um, and I think that's what Engels was 
in a way doing in origin of family private property in the state. Um, but that always comes at a cost, right? Uh, and the cost, I think, in his work is he ties the so-called world historic defeat of the female sex to the advent of private property, right? Uh, Rosa Luxemburg wrote a very interesting critique of this in 1907, 1908. It's published in volume one of her complete works now, uh, which only came to light about 10 or 12 years ago or so, uh, in which she took issue. Oh, no, it was an introduction to political economy. That's right. It's an introduction to political economy. She actually took issue with uh, angles on this. Uh, um, and uh, and said it was it was a monocausal explanation, which was too simplistic. She, she was not convinced by the argument. Without going into more details, there is a problem there, because if you tie the origin of the family, private property in the state, the existence of private property, it's easy for somebody, whether Engels intended that or not, to conclude that, oh, we abolish private property, private ownership of the means of production, and then we get rid of all these hierarchies, okay? Uh, which history has shown is a complete fallacy, okay? So what if Marx is not interested so much in origins, what is he interested in? Well, definitely he's interested in the present, right? Uh, he's a, this painstaking analysis of present social relations in non-Western context, especially. But why is he interested in that, right? Um, is why is he interested? He's interested in the present in order to see within the present seeds of the future. Okay. So when he says, uh, as his kind of uh, Engels does mention this in his in his origin, kind of the phrase from Marx in the ethnological notebooks, but I don't think Engels in any way uh, completed Marx's ethnological notebooks. I think there was just some scattered references to it. I don't think he absorbed the nuances of some of the Marx was, Marx was highlighting much of this. But in any case, uh, that the new society will be a, a, a return to some of the archaic formations of the past, but in higher form, but in higher form, okay? Uh, and he's thinking about Marx, the communal forms, et cetera, of, of non-individualistic forms of appropriation and organization, et cetera. Well, See, so what's the intellectual pursuit in his last years? I mean, there's the Paris Commune that's part of that last decade, right? And there's the, right, the Civil War in France and his writings on that and his disappointment seeing what's happening to the socialist movement in Europe, uh, which is going in a direction that he's very, very upset about, as you can see from his critique of the Gotha program. So he's looking for other possibilities of revolutionary emancipation, but you can't, he's not a utopian, so you have to find the seeds of that possible transformation into a higher form of society in the not in what does a non-western world have to contribute not just for non-western world but for the western world what do we learn to rethink the concept of socialism for um a given of these realities right uh now th that's maybe i'm posing that question in retrospect of in Mo of marx's work by i want to avoid reading into but that's definitely the question we're facing right uh the notion that socialism is about public ownership and private ownership of the means of blah, blah, blah. That's not going to animate humanity facing ecological destruction and the annihilation of civilization as we know it. There has to be a lot deeper conception of revolutionary transformation than that. And that's, I think, why uh, Marx's late writings especially become important uh, for the question of trying to put forward uh, some sort of a... Uh, a sense of, hey, what is the alternative to this continuous logic of capital that is kind of modifying and uh, objectifying, alienating, dehumanizing a more and more air arenas of the life world? Um, so Marx doesn't give us the answer to these things, but it, 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 it methodologically can help orientate us uh, in the direction of uh, these sorts of questions for today. Thanks. Um... Again, this is not an area which I regard myself as having any special expertise in, but from reading uh, Marcello's book, um, it uh, it seems to me that, I mean, what, what I'm struck by is the range of different uh, intellectual pursuits that Marx was uh, following, even right up to the end of his life. The central one, though, I mean, partly, you know, and I'm a bit suspicious of any attempt to introduce a, uh, a, a you know a, a too neat order in and unity into these uh, interests because it seems to me that the central uh, project that he had at the end of end of his life in the last decades of his life was to complete capital and when he ha had to because of his illness abandon uh, he did set aside uh, work on finishing uh, volume two, then there were all sorts of other interests he had, all sorts of other projects that he that he, he took forward. But I think it would be uh, 
Uh, I mean, as far as I can gather from what uh, Marcello wrote, and perhaps you can correct me, Marcello, if I'm wrong about this, but I mean, in a way, these were, these were, you know, these weren't a totally unified set of um, uh, pursuits that he had. These were things that he was following up, you know, interests that he was following up and uh, 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 issues that arose out of correspondence that he was having and so forth and so on. And they were very diverse. Uh, and they included not only, uh, you know, anthropological questions, questions of political economy, questions about uh, the nature of Russian society, but also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, he was still working on uh, reading works on chemistry and physics and even mathematics, strangely enough, uh, you know, at the end of his life. He, he described mathematics as a, an intellectual relaxation for him. Um, so he kept all these things going. Now, whether, you know, I mean, I, don't we have to be careful in introducing too much, a, a sort of false unity into them? Uh, they, you know, they're obviously unified by Marx's, uh, you know, by, by, the, by, by the whole history of Marx's intellectual uh, history, not one single project that was going on. It seems to be insofar as he had one single project. Uh, unfortunately, he was a force by illness, a force by illness to abandon that, the, the completion of capital uh, towards the end of his life. Well, it, but actually, Marcello quotes a letter from December of 1882, where Marx is discussing the fact that his publisher has asked him to revise volume one yet again. Mm -hmm. And Marx tells, uh, Marx says, I, I, I can't spare the time I'm working on volume two. I mean, I agree completely, Sean, that we don't want to impose a unity on Marx's late works that wasn't present in that in that body of, of work. And I think there's no question that uh, some of the rabbit holes that Marx went down were you know, apart from his, his effort to complete capital. Um, I, I don't really know if he needed to write a complete chronicle of, of, of history of the kind that, that Marcello was describing. Um, some of the some of the some of Engels' complaints about the you know the the excessive detail orientation that Marx demonstrated, um, I think were, were valid. But what I've noticed, just for, I, but I think there is more unity than than uh, than people suspect. Uh, I have noticed that I mean, Mar Marx studied chemistry on a if you, on a number of occasions. If you go back to his note, his just notebooks dating back to the fifties, you find that whenever he was dealing with certain kinds of questions about the circulation of capital. At that point, he resumed his study of chemistry because it was directly relevant. Um, even though he enjoyed working on calculus, apparently he was not very good at arithmetic. But even though he enjoyed working on enjoyed working on calculus, I think it's quite clear that if you're trying to explain global macrodynamics, that uh, mathematics is relevant. And the work that Marx was doing, um, inspired by the you know the physiocrats and the tableau économique. Uh, which led to the famous reproduction schemes in volume two of Capital. Um, that's a mathematical um, question. So oh, sure, I'm not suggesting, sorry, I'm not suggesting that math was just a sort of side hobby that had no connection with, you know, I mean, it was obviously connected with, the, you know, economic theories. Yeah, no, it's just, a, it's just a question of, of the degree to which there was some unity. And what I, what, I mean, this is, again, not something that I, I began with when I began delving into this material. Um, I don't think Marx was writing about ethnology. I don't think he was writing about anthropology when he took those notes. He was writing capital. He was writing capital because capital encompasses the world. You have to understand the world to understand the, 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 the growth and, in Peter's terms, the future of capitalism and the possible seeds of resistance. So I have been surprised at the, at the thematic parallels that I find in works that could appear to be very far apart. I mean, when Marx was writing about the origins of Roman law and the 12 tables, it could appear that he has wandered away from capital. But in, in reality, he's actually talking about the emergence of the kind of patriarchal domination over women that succeeded bride price. Uh, Roman patriarchy smashed the kind of bride purchase which had existed before and substituted something new. So at first hearing, it could appear to be a really different theme. And yet I do see threads. Yes, Marx went down some rabbit holes, but uh, what I what I discern from his correspondence with many people, Zorga and Danielson and others, is that 
he was working as hard as he could, as, as, as well as his health permitted, to complete capital. And he did not, uh, he did not expect to die uh, in early 1883. He, he was hoping to weave these threads together into a tapestry. Uh, just one last brief point. Uh, there's so much uh, uh, points that in Marcello's book I haven't had a chance to discuss more fully because of time. I hope our audience, of course, will be able to explore it on their own. But one point that really struck me is uh, the discussion of Marx's notes on Australian or Australian Aborigines and his argument that they knew law, they, they knew politics. He denies the notion that these indigenous societies are lawless. Uh, this is, relates, this is a very, very important point thinking about post capitalism, right? In a post-capitalist society, is there law? Well, if there is in pre-capitalist societies, in these communal societies that even are prior to uh, agriculture, let alone uh, industrial society, uh, would there not be in some form in post-capitalist society? So I think we we read this late text of Marx. It's always interesting to read it with the lens, even though when he's not discussing it, how does what he is saying in some way inform a vision of post-capitalism? Thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time to talk about other aspects of Marcello's book, uh, but we have, I guess we have already covered uh, a lot. Uh, thank you very much for giving me two hours of time, uh, Marcello, David, Peter, and Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morteza. Thank you, Morteza. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this.